Hi everyone, this is Dr. Peter Kahn. I'm a functional medicine doctor practicing in Phoenix, Arizona, or Gilbert, Arizona. And uh, this is the 91st episode of the Ask Dr. Khan Show. Welcome to the show. So what we do on the show is give you information that will help you solve your health puzzle and help you stay well. Today, we're going to talk about how inflammation leads to autoimmune disease. As you know, autoimmune disease are things like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Crohn's disease, um, irritable bowel disease, things like MS, Hashimoto's, thyroiditis. So there's a lot of different autoimmune diseases. There are over 140 different types of autoimmune diseases. And they're all really the same disease, just different names. Because all, the commonality of autoimmune disease is that the immune system is attacking the thyroid gland, or is attacking the joint, causing rheumatoid arthritis, or attacking the brain, causing MS. So what is causing autoimmune disease? Well, we know that inflammation can be a source of that. In fact, inflammation is a common theme across all autoimmune disease. And I will say inflammation is the common theme for many, many of the illnesses that we see in our Western society, such as heart disease, such as cancer, such as uh, cardiovascular diseases. So all disease basically have some inflammatory component to it. And we're gonna talk about inflammation and how that may cause autoimmune. And more importantly, what are the specific things you can do to reduce this inflammation, to inhibit it so that you don't end up developing autoimmune disease? Or if you already have autoimmune disease, how you can use this hack to hack your immune system to reduce inflammation, thereby putting your autoimmune disease either into remission or to reverse a symptom of that. Okay, so let's get right into it. All right, hi jo Joyce, good to see you on this show today. So just so you know, if you have any questions, please post it in the comment section. During the live show, if I catch it, I'll try to answer it. If not, I will answer all the questions at the end of the show. So let's talk about the mechanism of autoimmunity. So inflammation is what starts it. So inflammation is a catch-all word. And inflammation is basically signs of injury. Okay, so when your tissues become injured, inflammation is the healing response. So people make inflammation out to be a bad guy, but inflammation is how your body heals. So imagine this, you bang your elbow today, or you, know, you get a, a, God forbid, a, a puncture wound on your skin, okay? And what happens if you bang your elbow or you injure your tissue, like your elbow, what happens is it's gonna start to swell up, right? So there's four cardinal signs of inflammation, redness, swelling, heat, Right? It's going to get hot because your capillaries open up to bring more blood to the tissue to help usher in the white blood cells and the things that your body need to heal itself. And we're also going to get pain associated. Now, these symptoms, although unpleasant, is part of the healing response. Right? Why would you have redness and swelling? Because there's more blood floating to the area. There's maybe some swelling. And, there, and that the reason for the swelling is to splint the area. It's to create more pressure so you, 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 that the area is kind of immobilized, right? It's kind of like how, what you do when you injure your ankle. You, you, know, you wrap it up in an ace bandage or you, you, know, you break your bone. You use cast to immobilize the joint to protect it while it's trying to heal. So these are healing mechanisms. Why pain? So you don't move it too much, right? So you'll, you'll be able to heal. So inflammation is not bad chronic inflammation is bad. If you have inflammation that's ongoing and never shuts off, that would be bad, right? It'd be a house, you know, perhaps it's, uh, you know, it's on fire. So the sprinkler's going and the sprinkler system puts out the fire. Well, that's good, but if the fire is no longer there and you're still living in the house and the sprinkler system just runs all the time trying to put out the fire that's no longer there, then the house is going to be ruined. So we don't want chronic inflammation. We only want it when there's some type of injury, which inevitable it happens, right? We bang our elbow or we get sick, we get an infection. See, these are all different type of things that can trigger inflammation. So let's talk about triggers of inflammation for a second. And we'll talk about what does inflammation do to trigger autoimmune disease, okay? Since many of our clients and patients seek us out because we specifically focus on autoimmune disease. We're kind of the, you know, uh, the, the practice that specifically help people with chronic issues. So triggers of inflammation. 
injury can obviously do it. So this could be a car accident. This would be a traumatic wound, like a knife wound or a laceration or bullet wound, whatever. Injury can cause, and I will say injury includes traumatic brain injury, right? Like if you bang your head, like in a concussion, you may not have bleeding that's happening, but you banged your head and you're going to have injury and that can trigger inflammation as well. Another trigger will be food sensitivity. If you eat a food that you're sensitive and or allergic to, that may trigger inflammation also. So that's why diet is so important. Food is medicine. Let food be your medicine and let medicine be your food. So food sensitivity, all right? And then also chemical toxicity. Chemical toxin can actually induce inflammation as well, right? Like if you, if you get poisoned with something, you're gonna get cellular tissue damage from the chemical toxin injuring your cells. So the injury can be happening on a microscopic or cellular level. And then infections can also induce injury, right? Because basically your cells are being injured by a pathogen, virus, bacteria, and so forth. And the stress can actually trigger inflammation as well. So these are triggers of inflammation. No less stress can trigger inflammation. So mental stress, just by being stressed about something can trigger inflammation also. So there are other triggers as well, but these are the main ones. These are the things that you have a lot of control over, right, for the most part. You can change how you eat, you can uh, change your environment, what product you use, so that you don't get exposed to as many stuff. You know, stress, you can manage that. So these are things you have control, because we always want to focus on the things that you can do. So these are the triggers that can trigger inflammation. And what happens is, what is happening on a cellular level when you have inflammation? Well, there are many different immune cells that participate in this. It's a very complex orchestra. Inflammation is an immune system response. It's an immune response, okay? Inflammation is not just a boo-boo on your elbow. Inflammation is mediated or controlled by your immune system. So you say, what is the immune system? Well, it's the part that, def that defends you, that protects you. Yes, but what is the one thing that makes up the immune system? Well, it turns out that there's not one thing that makes up the immune system, right? That's why it's called the immune system, because there are actually multiple parts in your body that comprise this defense system. It's kind of like you have the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, Coast Guards. There are multiple branches in the military that protect our country. Same thing, your immune system has multiple different branches that does different things, right? So one of the cells that does this, which is really important, this is called a nuclear factor kappa B, N of kappa B. This is a very specialized immune cells that are kind of like the first defenders, right? They're the first one to rush to the scene. They're the first one that gets activated to actually go and start this inflammatory response. And what happens is this N of kappa B actually has a self-sustaining loop. It's a self-amplifying loop. What that means is the more N of kappa B you have, the more N of kappa B you will have. It's a fee forward cycle. So the more inflamed you get, the more this kind of just keep winding up and gets worse and worse and worse. So that's a problem, okay? And then what happens is when you have this N of kappa B wind up, the next thing is your glutathione system starts to kick in. And glutathione is an intracellular antioxidant. So this is an antioxidant, but also really important immune function. Controls your T regulatory cells, which regulate your immune system. So the NF kappa B is your first responder. And once you start this self-amplifying loop where your inflammation level is uh, starting to kick up, the glutathione level started to kick in as well to help you fight the oxidation, the, the, the inflammation. So on one hand, you kick up this inflammation, but your body has a way to reduce it. So it's like kind of a balance, right? Volume up, volume down. So it's a beautiful system. Now what happens is, Next is, then you have your barrier system. So what happens is when you become inflamed, your body will start to want to need more glutathione to fight this inflammation that's happening. And what happens is that's going to have an effect on your barrier system. So what is that? That's your gut lining, right? This is where leaky gut can happen 
because the more inflamed you become, the more your gut lining becomes compromised. So these barrier systems can start break to break down. So not only the gut lining, you also have the blood-brain barrier. And even the lung epithelial barrier, the lung barrier, right? So your lung lining is actually a barrier so that when you breathe oxygen and air, the lung has the ability to filter out like dust and particles, but only let oxygen into your tissue. So lung is a barrier as well. And what happens is these barriers will start to break down. That's why when people become chronically inflamed, they'll develop leaky gut, which is actually a systemic inflammatory. So this leads to more inflammation. The leaky gut leads to more inflammation. Blood-brain barrier breach, we call it leaky brain, also leads to more inflammation. And lung barrier breach leads to more inflammation. So everything becomes a self-sustaining cycle, okay? And so people with leaky gut would typically experience more inflammation, which can show up as joint pain, which can show up as, you know, digestive issues or gas or bloating or malabsorption. People with blood-brain barrier compromise due to the, this inflammation will start to develop brain fog, depression, anxiety, inability to concentrate. People with lung barrier, that starts to break down. These are typically people that will get upper respiratory issues or asthma as some of their symptoms. So this is how, what happens when you have these symptoms of asthma or brain fog or fatigue or digestive issue, you go to the medical doctor and guess what? They want to give you a drug for the symptoms. You get a drug for every symptom you have. Right? This, is, this might be some of your experience. You go to the medical doctor, you say, Doc, my, my joint hurts. Well, here's Tylenol. Here's a pain reliever for the joint pain, but the root cause of that joint pain is never discussed. That's the medical model. Now, a lot of people say that the medical system is broken, our healthcare system is broken. I'm going to tell you what, the healthcare system is not broken. The healthcare system is doing exactly what it was designed to do. The healthcare system is designed to treat symptoms with the drug or surgery. So the healthcare system is working beautifully the way it's designed. It's just that the way it's designed was not designed to keep you healthy. The way the healthcare system is designed is to keep you sick so we can sell more and more drugs. I mean, billion and trillion dollars of you know, industry just in healthcare alone, I mean, that's not going to go away overnight, right? They're not going to make that stop. So it's up to you to stop it. And how do you stop it? By learning information like this. And in just a second, I'm going to teach you how to actually fix this at every level so you can get healthy, so you don't become dependent on drugs or surgery. And when you start doing that, then what happens? The economics will shift out of drugs and surgery because by your choice, by your lifestyle choice, and more and more people will become healthier, will become less dependent on that system. And the system will slowly shift. So... This is a very important and noble cause, and I wish you would join me on that by sharing this video. Like, sh most importantly, share so more people can hear this message so that we can help people, okay? Now, as the barrier system start to break down, what happens is it's going to lead to this breakdown of your immune system. We're running out of room here. So let's make that arrow go up here. So as the barrier system start to break down, you start to get what's called Th1, Th2 imbalance. Okay. So here we have the T helper three. So these are your T regulatory cells. So I'm throwing some fancy name at you. Just stay with me here. So T regulatory cells are the immune cells that regulate how hard does your immune system attack something and which branch of the military do you use. So it turns out there's two major branches. There's a T helper one system and a T helper two system. The T helper one system are your killer cells. Okay, these are the cells that actually go and kill the bad guy. And the T helper two system is your antibody system. The antibody is like your immune system's way of remembering the bad guy so that next time when the same bad guy shows up, your immune system will say, oh, I fought this guy before. I can just mount, mount an attack real fast. So that's the basis of vaccination. When you get vaccinated, they're shooting you up with, injecting you with a life attenuated virus. So your body develops antibody against that virus. So next time you don't get sick. Theoretically, that's how it's supposed to work. So what happens is, as your system becomes more and more inflamed, 
you start to use up a lot of glutathione, and you end up, you end up with glutathione deficiency. When you don't have enough glutathione, your barrier system will start to break down. As your barrier system starts to break down, you'll start to lose T regulatory function, which means that this triangle that holds up this teeter-totter starts to really waver, start to become weak. And turn out the T regulatory cells need glutathione to function, so this helps with that, but if this has become depleted because your body's using it all up because you're so inflamed, then the T regulatory cells further cannot function. Gonna have to start to use a different color here. So as this guy started to break down, then your immune system started to become really unstable. So what that means is when the killer cells start to need to be deployed, it cannot deploy. Or when the antibodies need to be deployed, it cannot deploy. Or the, end, the killer cell is supposed to stop, kind of like that earlier analogy where you know the, the fire sprinkler is still sprinkling water even though there's no fire. Like you, you're having a defense mechanism where you don't need it anymore. It'd be like you know the cops is arresting the good guys, right? Is arresting the, the the good guys since the bad guy. That's autoimmune disease. So when the killer cells don't stop, cannot stop attacking your own body, that's autoimmune. Th1 autoimmune. When your body keeps making antibodies against your own tissue, it cannot stop. That's called Th2 dominant autoimmune. In any case, when your body loses the ability to regulate your immune system, either this guy go crazy or this guy go crazy. So you get end up with a teeter-totter that's out of balance. That's called an immune system imbalance, and that's really the gist of autoimmunity. That's how you get from inflammation caused by some type of trigger, triggering inflammation. This leads to this end of kappa B, which is a first responder cell, to start to wind up. The more it winds up, the more you get inflamed, you get these reactive oxygen species, you get oxidation, and glutathione being an antioxidant is there to fight it, so you end up becoming depleted lower in glutathione level because you're using it all up try to try to reduce the cycle, and as this glutathione becomes deficient, your barrier system breaks down, and that leads to T regulatory cell dysfunction, so your immune system gets out of balance, and you start to develop autoimmune disease, like lupus, like rheumatoid arthritis, like Hashimoto's, like Graves' disease, like MS, and so on and so forth. So what can we do about this? Naturally, from a natural perspective, because really, from a medical perspective, there's not much they can do about this. I mean, what they do with autoimmune disease is that they give you a immunosuppressing drug. They give you a drug that suppresses the immune system, that shut the whole immune system off because your immune system is attacking your own body. So let's shut it off so it's not attacking your body. Well, theoretically, you think it's a good idea, but realistically, you don't want your immune system to shut off because if you shut it all off, you lose the ability to fight infections, you lose the ability to fight cancer. It's not a pretty picture. In fact, they don't give immunosuppressant drugs to every single person with autoimmune disease. Certain autoimmune disease, they have no drug for, like Hashimoto's. They give you thyroid hormone, but that doesn't stop the immune system from attacking the thyroid. And they don't even give immunosuppressant drugs for thyroid people because it's too strong. The side effect is so great that they don't just give it to anybody. So there's basically very little solution out there for people with Hashimoto's or any, thyroid, uh, any autoimmune disease because the root cause, which are these triggers, are never talked about or addressed. I mean, when was the last time you went to your medical doctor and they said, you know, better look at chemical toxins. You know, maybe you're chronically exposed to stuff in our environment and we are all exposed. Our environment's toxic. So they never look at that. Maybe you have some food sensitivity. When is the last time your doctor said, we better run a food sensitivity panel? Now, they may have done food allergy panels, but food allergy is different than sensitivity. Food allergy is an immediate response, meaning you eat peanut, today you get hives, you, your throat swells up, you need EpiPen, you need Benadryl. That's an immediate response, that's what allergy is. Medical doctor test it. Sensitivity, medicine do not test for, because this is a delayed response, meaning if you eat something today, you may not get a response to up to five, three to five days later. So you may eat gluten today if you have gluten sensitivity. You may not feel bad today or tomorrow or even the third day. It might be the fourth day you start to feel something. And the reaction usually are subtle and not necessarily gastrointestinal. Meaning if you eat gluten, you may not feel a tummy ache. All you get may be just inflammation that's break down the gut barrier and the blood brain barrier and you get brain fog from eating gluten. You may not have any GI symptoms. So this is where Doctor don't test sensitivity, and the biggest reason why they don't test sensitivity is because there's no drug 
for the sensitivity. There's a drug for food allergies, Benadryl, EpiPen, but there's no drug for food sensitivity. There's no drug for it. The way you fix food sensitivity is one, reduce exposure or avoid it altogether the food that you're sensitive to, and number two, you improve your immune system by decreasing inflammation overall, improve the barrier system so you don't have a leaky gut, so that your immune system doesn't get all crazy and out of control. And that's really what autoimmune disease is, okay? So, let's talk about what are some of the things you can do to calm down this fire, this inflammation, and therefore reduce your risk of autoimmune disease, or if you already have autoimmune disease, what you can do to make it better from a you know, root cause perspective, okay? So one of the things that we could do, there's things that we can intervene here at the first responder level. So things that you can use there is simply turmeric, right? Many people have heard of turmeric, and resveratrol can do that as well. So these are two natural substances, herbs, that you can easily take to help reduce NF-gaPa B level, to stop the self-amplifying, this vicious cycle so that you, you don't, your body doesn't become more inflamed. Now, the thing with resveratrol and turmeric, in fact, both of them have very short half-lives. In fact, resveratrol have half-lives of minutes. So what that means is you take resveratrol, within minutes, it's metabolized, like half of it is gone, just naturally decomposed and you're just eliminated. So you don't get a lot of it unless you're doing it in a certain form. So we like resveratrol in a emulsified liquid form, okay? When it's emulsified, it becomes better absorbed. And also, we like to add black pepper extract to it because black pepper extract increases the half-life of, res of res resveratrol. So make it work longer, make it last longer before it's broken down, okay? And also, when we use a liquid form, it's easy to dose up because you can take a few, and then throughout the day, you can just continue to take it. So it's kind of like you have a con continuous drip into your system, which gives you longer-lasting effect. Turmeric kind of has the same thing. Black pepper extract tend to increase the half-life of turmeric. So we like these in an emulsified liquid form, which is what we use with our patients and our client base. Okay? So that's where you can intervene at this loop. What can we do here at the glutathione level, this antioxidant? Well, you don't want to just take any, any antioxidant. You want to take glutathione. So we, have, we use glutathione here, either straight up, we give you liposomal glutathione or acetoglutathione. And these are all stuff that we use with our uh, patients. We can uh, give you some links so you can see these products, see what they do. I have made videos that explain what these things do. So I'll give you those resources. Another thing that you can use is a product called Hepato GSH. So again, there's a video that I made about it. Today we're gonna run out of time here, but there's a video, I'm gonna put a link to it. And what this does is actually helps your body recycle the glutathione. It helps with glutathione recycling. And that's important because your body naturally, even though it uses it, it has the ability to recycle it. But that process is time dependent and energy dependent. So you can only do so much of it at a time. But hepato GSH contain ingredient that help supply the cofactors needed to speed up that glutathione recycling system. So that can help here. Okay, so every step we have some kind of intervention here. So with gut lining compromise, if you have leaky gut, then we use a product called GI resuscitate. So this contains L-glutamine, which is an amino acid that are the main amino acid for the enterocytes, which is your uh, cells in your intestinal lining to help regenerate themselves. It also contains deglycerized licorice root, which help decrease gut inflammation. It also contains marshmallow root, okra extract, aloe extract, things that are mucilaginous that coats the gut. So this is our main thing, the number one product we use to help with the leaky gut. Uh, as far as blood-brain barrier breach, how do you fix that? Well, same thing, you gotta fix the gut because there's a gut-brain connection. The gut and the brain are literally physically connected through nerves called vagus nerve and also immunologically connected. And this is a relatively new finding in science that there are actually lymphatic system, lymphatic channels that connects the gut and the brain. So the gut and the brain is intimately connected neurologically, immunologically, and endocrinology. So hormone connected, immune connected, and nerve connected. 
So the gut and the brain skin. So when the gut lining becomes compromised, your blood-brain barrier become compromised as well, and vice versa. So the way to fix the blood-brain barrier breach is to restore gut function because 70% of your immune system is in your gut. So that's where we start. However, if you have a lot of inflammation in your brain due to this barrier compromise, and you have neuroinflammation, then we may use things like, again, turmeric, uh, resveratrol, is a product we use, it's called uh, Neuroflan. And this product contains not only resveratrol, turmeric, but also other flavonoid compounds like epigenin and catechins. These are flavonoid compounds that can cross the blood-brain barrier and decrease inflammation in the brain by reducing the activity of microglial cells. So that's another thing that we use to help. Uh, and the lung barrier, if you have a problem with that, again, you got to fix the underlying inflammatory condition, which is leaky gut. Glutathione can help with that as well, as well as turmeric or resveratrol. It depends on if you have any type of chronic infection in the lung, we may have to do some type of pathogen cleanse and so forth. Okay? So what can we do at this level? Remember this arrow, this diagram actually goes to here because we ran out of room. So what can we do to intervene at a T-regulatory cellular level? Remember, this is a teeter-totter. Right, the, the balance that hold the teeter-totter in place. So what can we do to strengthen this? Like I mentioned earlier, you see this arrow pointing from glutathione to here. Glutathione is really important for T regulatory cell function. So by taking glutathione, either in glut liposomal glutathione or hepatogsh, we can improve function here. Another thing that's critical for T reg cell function is vitamin D3. This is critical for, for immune function. So many people have vitamin D deficiency despite sunshine, because you can't get enough sunshine to get enough vitamin D. That's why God made vitamin D in food. And most people getting sunshine, they're in like fully clothes, they have sunblock on, so basically that just blocks it all. So it's not enough. In my experience, my clinical experience, people who have regular sun exposure still have vitamin D deficiency because there's other factors involved, meaning if you have, if you're very inflamed, right, that's what we're talking about, you may use more vitamin D than other people. If you have autoimmune disease, you may use more vitamin D. If you have cortisol uh, elevations, if you have, make a lot of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, your vitamin D may not get absorbed very well. And some people have genetic issues where they have vitamin D receptor polymorphisms where they just can't absorb vitamin D that well. So there's a lot of factors, but the bottom line is you gotta regularly have blood tests, you got to work with a doctor that knows how to implement vitamin D therapy and track it regularly and increase that level. So this is where different interventions that we can do to help naturally, and this is our process. Okay, We have a process and an algorithm that help us to assess this. So if you have chronic condition and you're not feeling any better, and you have or a loved one or a family member that have a chronic condition, and you're not getting satisfying answers, and not getting any results from either your conventional doctor or your natural alternative practitioner, whoever it might be. If you're not getting answers, get a second opinion. Okay? Give us a call. We can help you. Okay? If you need to, just like, you know, I, I'm just not sure whether this is the right thing to do or not. We can set up for a, a free 15-minute call just to find out what's going on with you and whether this is the right place or what you can do to help you get better. And for a right fit, we can go ahead and move forward. Okay? So with that said, Hopefully this information helps you. Uh, we have a workshop this week. Yay! We have a workshop this Wednesday. It's an autoimmune solution workshop. We're going to go over much of this information in much more detail in a one-hour segment. This is an in-office workshop for those of you that are in-state. If you're out of state, we do offer consultations for clients uh, all over America and the globe. Actually, we have clients in Romania and in London. So if you need help, you can uh, access us that way by giving us a call or private uh, messages on Facebook or email us at info at ask.com.com and request a new client consultation. Next week, we have a thyroid solution workshop on Wednesday. So workshops are Wednesday at 5.30. You need to register though, because we only so have so many seats in the office. So please call 480-988-6269 to register for the workshop. If you're out of state, then give us a call, let's talk, let's see if we can help you to find answers because I know how frustrating it can be when you have no answers and your doctor's not being very helpful and, uh, and you're doing everything you can but you're still not feeling better. You deserve better than that and you need the answers and we'll help you with a very logical and scientific based solution that we're playing the detective or getting to the root cause instead of just treating the symptom. Hopefully this helps you. Please like, 
please share. The most important thing you can do is share this content because there's so many people that need to hear this that there is a natural solution. There's something they can do to help, uh, to help themselves or to find help. So please share this and comment if you like this video and also post any questions you may have. I'd be more than happy to answer these. I answer all the posts myself. So reach us that way. We're also on YouTube as well at Dr. Peter Khan on YouTube. So look us up. We're going to put links to uh, some of these resources for you. So if you need help, look us up. Take care. We'll see you next week.